Hey everyone, this is Chris. I just got back from Gen Con yesterday. I uh, got a little bit of a cold that I managed to pick up thanks to 60,000 strangers in the convention hall, plus a little bit of air travel on top of that. But I still want to sit down, record a video to make up for the gameplay that I didn't do over the weekend. Uh, I give you guys a little bit of a talk through of what I did at the con that I think you might be interested in. Uh, how the decks I built performed, and you know some of my thoughts on Wizard's Quest and the Arkham Horror stuff. Uh, I did buy Withered Heath at the con, that is one thing, which means that in theory I should be able to use some of those cards in deck builds for the next video that I'm going to make. Uh, there's a few of them that I'm really looking forward to, although those cards are in the box that I shipped back to myself from the con, so they're not here right now, which means that like if anything goes wrong with that shipping, which unfortunately has happened to me plenty, uh, I won't have access to them for at least another week. So fingers crossed. Well, what can I say about the con itself? Uh, Gen Con was great. It was absolutely fantastic to just hang out with basically everyone that I know from Discord that I talk to all the time about Lord of the Rings, Arkham Horror, uh, the hosts of the podcasts that I am not always so good at listening to, people who have blogs and make videos, uh, you know, just a ton of community members that I met and got a chance to actually sit down and play games with, a different slice of community members from every previous Gen Con, so all good things there. I did get to play the Wizard's Quest on Thursday morning. Me and Big Foam Loaf from Discord played competitive against Chad and Aaron from Cardboard of the Rings. Uh, and we crushed them. <laughs> I wanted to be a little bit nice about it because it felt a little bad while we were playing, but no, we absolutely destroyed them. Um, I started them off with two, with three locations in the staging area, and first round staging didn't help. Second round staging for them revealed a treachery that prevented them from playing a lot of cards, sort of really disrupted the flow of the air store deck that uh, Aaron was running. It turned into a huge mess for them, and so eventually they threaded out something like round three or four. Uh, and Big Fun Loaf and I continued to see if we could win the quest on our own. Um, both teams in that competitive mode did draw the big Nazgul from Wizard's Quest in the first staging step. Um, but fortunately for you guys and for me, and Big Fun Loaf, and not so great for Chad and Aaron, uh, this wonderful Aeon. Bayorn combo was able to knock it out of the park. Uh, that enemy was also not immune to player card effects, so I could just faint it. Uh, and Big Film Wolf and I actually had a really good pair of decks that we did not coordinate on at all. Uh, I had this tactics deck with all of its allies and its combat potential and its defenses, and he had a big questing support deck plus Haldir. So between the two of us, we had enough willpower to deal with any of the things that popped up in the staging area. Uh, and oftentimes little enemies I would engage and then not have to defend because Haldir would just kill them right away. Um, we took a bunch of attacks from the other Nazgul in the encounter set, but between the two of us, we had enough chump allies and enough disposable things that that wasn't really a problem and the willpower potential of my tactics deck plus his support deck was really good. And it worked out great. Uh, we tried again after that with the, my Theodrid, Elrond, etc. support deck, uh, which I do think would work really well with this tactics deck, but I chose to start us off with three locations that time just to sort of see how much worse it was. Oh my god, it was so much worse. So if you are going to 
do one of the events this year where you play Wizard's Quest or um, I forget what the other one is called, Woodland Hills, something like that. My recommendation for you, if you want to be mean, is to pick as many locations as you can to start in play, uh, assuming the other one has a similar sort of setup. Um, it You need to be prepared to deal with it, otherwise you can quite quickly fall behind on the staging area. Uh, and there's some nasty locations in there for sure. Some incredible enemies too, don't get me wrong. There's the big Nazgul and there's a whole bunch of trolls and some effects that really mess with trolls. Uh, wargs that will swarm you all over the place. Although thankfully they don't tend to bounce back into the staging area like you have seen happen to me over and over again. Um, but I think people gunning for sort of competitive success are going to bring decks that can fight really well early and having a bunch of locations which you can't easily eliminate from the staging area is one way that your group could get ahead. I also did manage to somehow acquire and play the Eternal Slumber, the Arkham Horror scenario. Uh, I did not have a ticket for one of those events. I just showed up with generics and there was a big long line of people waiting. I think this was Friday morning um, in order to get their chance. And <laughs> I was the person after the line got cut off and the guy taking the tickets at the Fantasy Flight booth was like, okay, everybody else does not get into the event. <laughs> the fact that I'd been there for an hour and was one, one too far in the line was a little disappointing. Uh, but he did end up giving all the people who had been waiting the copies of this scenario. And I heard some weird things about like later groups having a lot of problems uh, with the amount of scenarios that were available. So I don't know if that messed that up, but I did get my copy. Uh, sat down with Big Fun Loaf again and Atric from Discord to try a three-player Eternal Slumber. Uh, Big Fun Loaf had played before, but he sort of did not give us too much guidance about what we needed to do and what needed to happen. Uh, I played this min deck, which is basically 100% skills. Uh, there are a few assets in here and a few fast events that help support people. Uh, I have Shortcut, which you know helps move other investigators around. And I have the big four experience card that allows you to give someone three cards at fast speed. Uh, and that was phenomenal during the game. Just like, oh, your opening hand sucks. Well, here, have three more cards. Maybe you will be able to do better. I did get Min's signature asset in play, the analytical mind, which allows you to commit cards to skill tests at other locations and to draw a card whenever you commit only one to a skill test. And that was fantastic. Just being able to like toss a skill card at literally any location on the board was great. Uh, unfortunately, as the scenario progressed, and it's quite a long one, uh, we, we thought we had most things under control, but we didn't have a very good way of dealing with enemies on our team. Uh, I have a very supporting min deck uh, Big Foam Wolf was playing Carolyn, who made approximately infinite dollars by healing sanity. Like way more than you would expect. Uh, and Atric was playing Finn, and her deck was mostly geared towards getting clues and running away from enemies. Which, don't get me wrong, is absolutely great. But we just sort of left everything alive and all over the board. So when we had to go back and start dealing with things, uh, we realized that we could not. I think our result was still pretty good for a team that did not end up winning. Uh, none of our allies or investigators were lost to the abyss, which, you know, in theory is good for the follow-up scenario to this one. Uh, the strength of the abyss, which is a scaling mechanic built into the scenario, was pretty low, relatively speaking. 
Uh, we got to the final act and agenda, and it was only at four, which you know means we did not bump it up too many times. We didn't suffer too many of the bad things that could have happened, but completely bogged down with enemies that we were unable to kill, we all decided that we were just going to get out. <laughs> it was not a very satisfying end to the scenario, but in standalone play, the difference between everybody died in Egypt and everybody got out on the train is not very high. I did also bring my chaos cards, which you can see here. Uh, we didn't use them though. We had a, an actual bag with the tokens. Um, just show off what those look like on the other side in case anyone hasn't seen them. Uh, one thing I will say is that having done this, standalone Arkham Horror plays an awful lot like what I enjoy from Lord of the Rings. Uh, you sort of build your decks, you know the kinds of challenges that you're likely to face, and you can sort of tune and tweak and try and figure out how to overcome them. Uh, I think, obviously, you can build some incredibly powerful decks by just ramping up the XP and buying all of the really powerful cards, uh, especially for some factions. I think that is very, very easy to do. Uh, it's slightly balanced out by the extra weaknesses you have to add to your deck. But for the most part, adding more XP makes for stronger decks. Um, and I think it'd be really interesting to do some deck building videos where I brew up some standalone solo Arkham Horror decks and take them up against some scenarios. Uh, and this right now is sort of serving as a test for me to see if I could flip over a Chaos card and have that be recognizable on the screen. Uh, I think that looks pretty clear just checking it out over there. Uh, but it was definitely a bit of a reminder of why I still prefer Lord of the Rings. Uh, just the campaign nature that most of the Arkham players really love to me just means, oh, your deck building is limited. And then in between scenarios, you get to like make a couple of decisions, that's not fun. I would much rather build new decks all the time. Um, so if I do a campaign, a narrative campaign, what I will probably do is basically treat it as a bunch of standalone games, uh, make my decisions and carry them forward, but instead of you know sticking with one investigator in one deck the whole time, uh, rebuild for standalone mode with the campaign choices that have been made and progress through. But I don't know when I'm gonna have time to do that, so it's just an idea at this point. The Eternal Slumber was definitely cool though, and I hope it comes out much faster than Labyrinths of Lunacy for anyone who's gonna wait for that. Oh, let's see, what else did I do at the con? I browsed the dealer hall and resisted the urge to buy too much stuff. Although the by far the coolest things that I bought were these dragon shield, uh, they're art sleeves in a very literal sense. <laughs> it was not something that I expected. And unfortunately, apparently they're con exclusives, but I bought both of these dragon shield art sleeves that are uh, adaptations of famous paintings with dragons in them now. Uh, so this is a, oh God, I'm gonna butcher this because I've already forgotten. Yeah, right. This is a Monet, a painting of a poppy field with a boy and now a dragon. Uh, and this is Whistler's mother with a dragon. And they're fantastic. Uh, I, I like dragon shields. I, mean, I don't talk about this much, but like all of my Lord of the Rings are in dragon shields. All of my Arkham are in dragon shields because I just love the way they feel. And these art sleeves feel even better. I don't know, they're like thinner, the bumps on the edges of the sleeves are not as pronounced as they are with the other dragon shields. Uh, the sleeves come flatter in the box, as opposed to my normal dragon shields, which always end up weirdly curved. 
Anyways, they are super sweet, and I have no idea what I'm going to do with them. I, but I just kind of love them. <laughs> Maybe I'll get back into Throne so I can play Whistler's Mother with Dragon Sleeves for a Targaryen deck. Seems appropriate, right? Let's get those out of the way. Uh, what else did I do? I played a Thornwatch event. It was this neat scenario that they did as a con exclusive. Um, you know, you get a bunch of people in the room. One person in Thornwatch is playing as the judge and their goal for the scenario was to corrupt the player characters and sort of force them to switch sides. Uh, my group did well enough, I think mostly due to some rules confusion at spreading the corruption around so that we didn't have to deal with that, but like, just hearing all the things that were going on all over the place. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, the game was interesting. It's, it's gorgeous. Uh, the Penny Arcade artist did a really good job with the character designs. And everything felt super cohesive. Uh, and very stylized. But I did not decide to buy the game because it's a one versus many, and it's not a kind of game that I usually tend to play a lot of. Uh, and there was the special listener event for Cardboard of the Rings and Mythos Busters, which I am sure you're going to hear about on both of those podcasts if you listen to either one of them. It's been quite some time since I closed out a bar but people were there playing games until that late, so <laughs> games were played. Uh, it may have been a mistake. I definitely was exhausted all day Sunday because of this. There was a surprising amount of yelling going on in the bar, although I wasn't involved in the secret Hitler game that taught everyone that Aaron has a face that cannot be trusted even when he's being totally honest. Uh, it was it was a lot of fun. There were a lot of different games that people played. Some big party group games, some sort of smaller things. Uh, apparently some people played Happy Salmon again, but I missed it. I think the most interesting one that I played was The Mind, which is just a very weird game of reading body language and bizarre triumph as you cooperate with people without talking to somehow successfully play cards in sequential order. It's hard. <laughs> and yeah, I know, in lots of ways it's not really a game, but it's okay. Definitely fun to do with a beer and sort of an open mind in case you ever get the chance. Maybe not worth 15 bucks. I don't know. All right, cycling back to the Lord of the Rings decks, because I, I did say I was going to talk about this, and I do want to. Uh, the tactics deck was fantastic. There is more willpower in here than you would sort of expect. Um, eagle allies like these Eagles of the Misty Mountains, which I swapped in at some point, uh, definitely capable of questing. Uh, Beaufort 2 is pretty easy, especially if you drop him in from here gone, you know, two resources for two willpower. That's the return we're looking at for spheres that are better at questing than tactics. So to get it here is fantastic. He also gets three hit points and two attack if you want to use them, both of which came in handy during the scenario. Interdine Hunter, also great for willpower if you don't need to kill anything. I did not manage to get Hauberk of Mail on Durndingle Warrior, but most of the rest of the Eagles came out to play. Uh, Legolas helped us kill some enemies and draw some cards. Uh, I did, finally, for once, the only time ever, uh, get to use Knight of Minas Tirith to pull an enemy out of the staging area and immediately kill it with this response. <laughs> Uh, thanks to the stat buff of Hirgon, making the Knight of Minas Tirith a four attack, I was able to engage one of those wargs, bring it down out of the staging area, and knock it out in one go. 
<laughs> Caleb was watching when that happened and he was glad to see someone do it. So apparently it's not very common. But yeah, no, this deck did exactly what it was meant to do. Uh, it comes out swinging early, a lot of potential on attack and willpower with a sort of limited shelf life defense. Um, and that almost bit us because one of the stages of Wizard's Quest sees you getting an attack from a six attack enemy from the staging area that you are not capable of interacting with because it's immune to player card effects. Uh, so we had to chump those a lot until we could actually kill it. Uh, Bayorn ended the game with nine points of damage on him, and it was very close to being 10 if I had gotten a different shadow effect on one of those attacks. The other deck, this sort of questing support deck, uh, really did not do as well, and I think part of the issue was that I kept an opening hand that was a little slow. I had Firial, who was going to ramp up the willpower as we added more and more locations to the staging area. And I did have Joubert with a Hobart for him, uh, which was absolutely fantastic. That's no downsides to this. Uh, just a great ally and attachment combo. Um, Joubert was in the first game too with the tactics deck. But, I mean, these allies are five resources each. Uh, it is not quick to get off the ground. And what I really needed more than anything else was some early willpower to make up for what we didn't have elsewhere in the deck. I mean, I think even if I had just kept a hand with a couple of Ents instead of Firial so that I could start pumping out that willpower a couple turns earlier, that it would have gone a lot better in that attempt at the quest. Uh, but we didn't actually end up getting to finish it. We <laughs> decided to abandon because the siren song of lunch was much more pressing. Uh, and I think that is a, a sort of fair summary of how these decks went. Uh, I put a little more thought into this one, try and make up the shortcomings that I saw in the tactics deck. And I do believe that playing them both together would actually work really well. Because um, the non-tactics deck still does quest for at least six right away. It has the potential to take a bunch of attacks without having to deal like that. I mean, to lose any allies or take any damage. Uh, and when you combine that with the tactics deck sort of ability to deal with big enemies while still putting out a good amount of willpower at the beginning of the quest, uh, I think those two would combine really well. Uh, paired up with a less aggressive deck, a uh, slightly less specifically matched up deck, uh, I think the pairing is not as good. I had Hauberk of Mail in my hand with this deck and didn't have anything to play it on, which was a bit of a bummer, but it's the sort of thing that you expect when you bring a deck and somebody else brings a deck and you haven't coordinated it all, uh, especially since apparently my <laughs> Phaedrid and Elrond were heroes in sort of hot contention. Oh well. We won once and did not finish the second attempt, so I'm not too worried about it. I'm definitely looking forward to the second set of Wizard's Quest cards, though, because that quest is awesome. Still slightly bummed that you really can't play solo very well. There's so many effects that rely on your opponents making a choice. And that's great fun when you have opponents and you're sitting there next to someone playing the encounter deck that you built for them and they're like, okay, I need you to do something. Like I need you to pick an encounter card for us to deal with. That feels really good. But on the flip side, sitting there by yourself, 
flipping over a quest stage and saying, okay, I need to pick the worst of these for myself. It's not the same. All right, everyone. That is my somewhat brief, although not terribly, uh, recap of Gen Con, the Lord of the Rings Arkham Horror stuff that I did, the small amount of things that I purchased. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed. And if you were thinking about coming to Gen Con in order to hang out with podcasters and stuff like that, play some games, uh, I really recommend it. It's a lot of fun. Definitely expensive, so don't let me sway you if it's not in your budget, but I had a blast this year just like I do every year. So, thanks for watching.